All right. So uh, we're here to talk about uh, building a society from scratch. And uh, uh, so I'm writing something down and it basically starts off with a hypothetical because I like the idea, like in one, you, you have to know your starting spot. So if, right now, most of the world is, uh, you know, land is taken up or land is being preserved. So we couldn't imagine starting a society now. And if we go back to like 6,000 years ago when bigger societies were first started, we don't have all the the information technology that we've learned from. So I have this hypothetical that kind of does a mixture of the two where um, for this project, I like to imagine that there was some um, natural disaster. All of uh, land is covered with water except for North America. And there's 3 million people left. Um, this natural disaster uh, took out everything man-made. So there's, you know, we don't have phones. We don't even have buildings. Um, every, all the books are destroyed. We, there's no laws. There's no, there's no nothing. Um, so after this happened, essentially uh, these 3 million people are just like kind of grouped together. Like you'd see in any um, apocalypse type movie where there might be groups of 20 that are trying to survive, find food, uh, figure out different things, but there, there are no laws. And so the idea of this book is to, to figure out what the first and most important laws and setups are for if say you, David, were, were one of the 3 million and you were going to try to get a group of people together, five, 10, whatever, maybe work towards thousands and say, Hey, this is what we should do to live better if you know if we create these laws and and different things um and so uh essentially i have a i have a, what i think is the most important law and then i also have what i think is the most important like right and freedom and then a list of things that are must like that i think you must have to um to have a society that uh has law and order and can function so let's just start off with the first one i have listed here which would be military if you get a group together that says like th this is our land and we want to take care of each other, I think um, in some form or another, you have to have a military of sorts where if other people tried to come in and maybe take the food you're growing or whatever, you'd be able to fight them off. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on basic level of military? So just a clarifying question. There's 3 million people left in the world. Um, and you're 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 uh, saying that we would split off into groups of thousands, something like that. Um. Yeah. Well, I imagine that back in the day before there were um, bigger societies that humans probably lived somewhat like chimps, where there'd be groups of like anywhere from twenty to like hundred, hundred and fifty. Um. So I imagine it more so something like that. Okay. And and the when I mentioned a thousand, I mentioned the idea of if you and your group of twenty wanted to convince others, maybe you could get like a thousand or so together and say, "Hey, let's right. uh, live together, but also let's make laws that we all have to abide by," and that kind of thing. Right. So on the on the topic of military, um, that yeah, that would definitely be be where where I start. So society, uh, what I think of society as is. A lot of things, but first and foremost, the distribution of violence, actually, which sounds kind of wrong. But when you think about it, the government sets these laws, sets these uh, things that you have to live by. And then so that's the legislative branch. And then there's the executive branch that um, enforces them. And while, you know, like shoplifting, you're not going to go to well, well, hopefully you don't, you know, get brutalized by cops while you're shoplifting but if you resist then that's what that that's what ends up happening so those people the enforcement are privileged with uh the are privileged with the ability to use violence to uh, bring an end to a conflict so first and foremost uh the topic of violence needs to be mentioned so what warrants violence what doesn't who gets to do it um how should they do it so it's a really tough question. Um, no man-made technologies, so you would have to go. You would have to go kind of caveman with that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Sticks and stones, literally. Um, so, unfortunately, uh, society is also our attempt to break away from our evolutionary roots as, like monkeys or apes, you know, 
instead of uh, letting those urges, uh, letting that programming guide us, instead we build something where we can actually take a moment to think about what we're doing. But since we don't really have that yet, this is just starting out, it would have to be the most physically fit people to start out that would mm-hmm. form kind of the military, the military, and a, it would probably serve as also the police um, in case things escalate to the circumstance where violence is needed, you would need physically fit people to start out. So uh, let's say you had a group of like a hundred. Um, that's pr- that's a pretty big size. Um, you would want. Oh, I, I I guess I shouldn't fudge around too much with numbers since it's it's a hypothetical. But you would want at least uh, I think thirty people. Um, to uh, serve as kind of a dedicated military. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, I think I, I agree on that. I'm, I'm not sure. I have heard some people just loosely talk about the idea of military not needing to exist because they're anti-war and all this stuff. And so you never know. Um, but uh, I think uh, people like that probably just haven't thought it through. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I would say uh, military is needed and something like what you're saying where we have a small number right now. So it has to be a number within that within that group and then um that that's just the bare bones of it so let's let's uh let's go to the next one just because i want to see if any of these like big ones if you think um they actually are just like current ideas that aren't necessary so the next one i have is borders and it's uh basically my idea is just that um if you if you are calling yourselves a group and you have a military to protect yourselves you have to essentially say from this point where I like for, we're from this tree to this tree and then basically make a surrounding, you say, this is where we're calling our area that if somebody comes in and tries to harm us, like if we leave this area, that's our own bad. <laughs> but if somebody comes into our area, this is our area. Do, do you think borders are necessary in that, in that basic sense? I would say so. Um, which shouldn't discount the possibility of diplomacy uh, because especially when things are scarce and um, if, so your primary goal should, if you're the leader of such a civilization should be uh, to protect the lives of your own group to start out, that should be your first and foremost goal. Um, But a secondary goal, if you can manage it is to also try to protect the continuation of the species um, and even even uh, animals that do live in these uh, smaller groups, they might compete with each other, but they don't do anything excessive. So sometimes it really does come down to violence and lives do need to be lost in order to sort something out if an agreement can't be made. But um, while you're starting out, borders are necessary so that uh, enemies know where to stay out and people know and your people know where to stay in. It's also yeah. a matter of safety. Yeah, definitely. Um, All right. So this next one, uh, this is the last of the first three that are just, they seem to be necessary and they're just simple and basic, but this one's a little less basic. Uh, um, I wrote immigration option. So the, it makes sense to me that uh, a place that's starting off or, or even not starting off that depending on their resources, depending on various different things, they could it might make sense and be reasonable to say nobody can move into these borders and it also might be reasonable to have an endless amount of people that can move into the borders but uh basically just saying that countering the idea of it being wrong to to stop people from coming in and like outside of the idea of say some, I mean, I guess we can compare it to ideas like what we think of immigration with the U S or what we think of immigration compared to maybe a country that has less or no immigration, like Scotland or Hong Kong or something. And, uh, but then also looking at it mostly at the level of, um, a hypothetical where is it always right or wrong? So immigration in this context of the hypothetical would be um, a trading of, I guess, uh, probably technology or techniques. Um, so, I mean, I guess we, uh, we're we all kind of just in the same situation and it's not like uh, 
So, so if the if if the hypothetical was that the world was like almost all the world was wiped out except for three million people, um, depending on who those people are, the three million, um, there might be some skills that, especially from hunter civilizations that still largely depend on hunt, hunting gathering, you would want some of those people in your tribe to at least, or not tribe, but your your group um, to at least teach you uh, how do I do this? How do I do this without you know, with preserving as much of the meat as possible, because that's also a skill. Um, and even people with the, so the agriculture in the United States, for example, that's not, if, if all technology is wiped out, that's not something you could do in this hypothetical. So you would want to go back to, you would want to have people that kind of know how to do that uh, more labor-based uh, agriculture, small scale mm -hmm. um, in your group. Um, and then in exchange for those societies that aren't as developed. Um, so if, let's say that, you know, we have the uh, the New York City tribe who is mostly used, is pretty used to a pretty urbanized environment. So um, now that a lot of the infrastructure to keep that urban environment running doesn't actually work, they would want to have people that would be knowledgeable in how to do small scale agriculture, hunting, in return, they could provide maybe some medical tips or like medical people, people that know how to treat wounds, keep it disinfected to uh, back to um, the people that are. And if, if your society is still like primarily small scale agriculture and hunting and gathering, they probably don't have that kind of knowledge. So in that sense, that would that would be the probably the totality of immigration. Um, as it as it gotcha. as it stands in modern society, uh, that would be different. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Because I, I think there's some cases for it, and some cases to not have it. I don't. I don't really have any thoughts with like the U.S. and immigration. I don't. I know that it's a big topic for a lot of people, and it's it's way too complicated for me. Anytime you get into the millions, uh, it's the type of thing that you know I I haven't uh, studied to know what the politicians know. As far as uh, what's best and what has and has not harmed like the country or anything, but uh, m mostly just uh, scaling this down and looking at um, the possibilities. I, I think you're right that like if you have a group of a thousand that are calling themselves a society and somebody that is not part of their society says, hey, I heard about your society. I'd love to come in. And it turns out that they have a lot of useful information. Um, it could be good to bring them in. Um, it also could be good that if you uh, if you're out, if you go outside of your society because you're looking around for certain things to bring back in and you stumble across somebody that seems like they need a lot of help. Maybe you you found somebody that was about to be murdered. And for let's say this this thousand of pe people are super empathetic and then they save this person's life. They might want to bring them in, too, because they they feel that there's no harm bringing them in. Um, but at the other end, I just I wonder because I know a lot of people that say there should be open borders. There should be no limits to how uh, people come in and out of a society. And I don't I don't know how that would work in the U.S. But um, looking at this uh, thousand scale, would you say that it's reasonable if the groups like let's say they didn't need help from outsiders and they couldn't find any outsiders that um, that we're going to add to the group? Um, or even let's say that they got their group up to like 10,000 and they felt like this is the size of group we want. And then anybody else in this society is going to be kids of the people in it. Do you think it's um, at least uh, morally acceptable or any other <laughs> form of acceptable uh, to say we are us and this is what we are? Um, at some point, we, we can let people come visit, but we don't want to let anybody immigrate into our our borders morality is always uh, a touchy subject subject whenever you get into hypotheticals because morality depends on the situation i don't believe in absolute mor morality um mm -hmm. i don't know if you do but it would be entirely it would be entirely dependent on what the circumstances of that society are if there are if there is enough food to support 1000 plus 5 uh with the five being the immigrants, that's one thing. But if there's not enough to support the 1,000, that's another thing. So um, the reason why immigration is so contentious is because 
there's two there are two uh, components well, there's more but there's two primary uh, components to that uh, one is what you mentioned is it morally right to even have borders in the first place um, and some people some people might say no because it's not like we respected the borders uh, we when, when I when I say we uh, Americans or not Americans the Europeans that colonized America in the first place it's not like they respect respected borders um so what what right do they have to enforce borders to other people uh but the other other uh component to that is what resources we have so um the really naive look at it is that we have we have homeless people in the united states we should do something about that first before we try to tackle the problems of other countries um but then you get into budget and like how there's like a there's like a there's uh, something in the billions of unaccounted money in the DOD budget. Where's that mm -hmm. going? What's it doing? Do they need it? If they probably don't need it, um, could that money be used to um, not only help people uh, within our country that are already suffering from poverty, but could it be used to help people that come over? And then the other thing is that, uh, do we have a moral obligation to help uh, refugees um, of countries that we've messed up. Um, so for example, a lot of South, and this is very contentious stuff, but broad strokes, South America, we kind of, we kind of screw with them a lot. Um, if we get a whiff of socialism, we go in there and, and state our own guy. Um, Brazil actually just had um, our CIA, uh, CIA planted dictator basically uh, voted out um if i have the if i have the details right so um you know we kind of mess up their country so they're seeking refuge in our country mm. do we have a moral obligation to so it's very complicated on a lot of topics uh For immigration sure. is yeah 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 definitely well and that's a that's a big part of why i'm doing this writing is because when it comes to these topics we can look at what we have and we, we can have ideas we can hear various things but kind of like when you're talking about that, uh, the budget in the millions, or maybe you said billions, um, uh, mm -hmm. the, it's not anything I'm too familiar with. But another thing I'm not too familiar with is the um, the uh, the national debt. It's like in it's 30, 31 trillion. I, I right. don't know. I don't know exactly what it means for a country to be in debt. And so for a country to have a budget in the billions, but also to be in debt in the trillions, uh, m part of my my mind just goes, oh, we should have that mean that we are that much less in debt <laughs> but uh but all these things are so complicated that that's why i, I like the idea because i'm very fascinated by politics and philosophy that i like the idea of um going down to a small scale and knowing that understanding the small scale won't um won't make it instantly easy to understand the big scale but uh i think it'll get some people closer including myself um, so for for a quick sec, let's look at this where I want to go over that thing you said, where if you have a thousand people in there and you have enough food for a thousand and five um, that, you know, should we bring in five to help them? Um, I, I think it's complicated because um, enough food makes you wonder what that means, like enough food for that day or likely for a month. Um, right. Yeah. It, it becomes complicated because. Well, for one, I, I guess we can just imagine that this society will figure out technology pretty soon. So we can assume that uh, we have the capability to uh, freeze uh, food, to dry food, and to make greenhouses. So we can imagine that there can be food uh, for a longer period of time. Um, so I guess considering that moral element, um, I'm trying to base the book not on morals, so I don't know why I brought morals up. But uh, mm -hmm. considering that moral element of like, the the duty to help others like in my mind i want to help others at all times i don't think i have the capability of not helping if i can for example <laughs> when i even when i'm crossing the street if i see there are worms on the cement and i know they can't go in the cement i actually pick them up i i, I spend way too much time doing that because i live in oregon and it rains a lot here and so mm -hmm. I, I have this weird thing where i can't if i see a person or an animal or something in need i i happen to help but I do wonder if people are obligated to or should or or um, yeah, if they should be if if even 
Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of hard to break down. But so I wonder. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, so yeah, what are I guess what are your what are your thoughts on that? Like, um, do do you think it's necessary for humans to all be moral? Or let's say this. Let's say you live in a different society that also has, let's say, 10,000 people. And let's say this one we're talking about also has 10,000. And uh, and the, the 10,000 that you are not in, they have the ability to feed, let's say, 20,000. But they, they don't, they don't want to let anybody in. They have 10,000 and they feel comfortable with that group. Now, you live in a group that has 10,000 that might let people in. And you, you if you saw a, a murder happening you would um, maybe you would kill the guy that's uh, trying to kill the other guy. And let's say that's not even in your society. That's just out in nature. You're wandering around and you are a person that wants to help people and bring justice. Would you want your group of 10,000 to force the other group of 10,000 to let people in because they can feed more? I think uh, so when it comes to immigration, there's also the cultural component. Um, I would probably uh, attack it more from the resources angle. They have 20,000. Uh, they can feed 20,000, but they have 10 and feed means they're secure for like the year or something. So mm -hmm. um, they can feed 20,000, but they only have 10,000. Uh, and force means a lot of things. I don't know if I would go to war over one person, but uh possibly looking at the resources, seeing if those resources can be shared. That would be the angle I look at it. Um, because uh, integrating someone into a society that's hostile to them, that doesn't sound like a great solution to me either. Um, mm -hmm. So look along the avenues of morals, I know you don't want to write them into the book, but it's going to be something that the, even if it's not explicitly mentioned, it's going to be something at the back of everyone's minds. Morality to me is what is, what is optimal for the continuation of the species or maybe looking at it at a smaller scale, the continuation of your group. Um, and if that means to the exclusion of other groups, maybe that's what it means. So for example, homosexuality was viewed as immoral for a very long time, mm -hmm. uh, arguably still today. Um, but that was because the population boom happened relatively recently. So before that, um, and that was connected to the industrial revolution agricultural revolution, all that. So before that, uh, people were in, or peoples, I guess, groups of people were in legitimate danger of being wiped out by, you know, like one straight earthquake or something like that. So it was important to build up your population as much as possible. And uh, that's not really possible with homosexual people. So that was viewed as immoral. Uh, but nowadays, at least in the society, societies like uh, United States, um, there's there's an argument that there's too many people um and globally speaking there's arguments that the world can't support uh what the projections estimate stuff like that that's why elon musk is going out to mars trying to see if they can colonize it mm -hmm. so but in this in the situation where we have enough people now we're kind of shifting over to homosexuality is not immoral um so that's why uh in terms of morals, it's difficult when it comes to hypotheticals. Things change depending on the circumstances. Um, so w if people should be morally obligated to help others, uh, the legal answer is really easy. No, they shouldn't be. Um, that's why, you know, if uh, I think there's a there's like a legal precedent or like a famous legal example is if you're on the subway, someone tosses a grenade at you, uh, are you liable if you toss it at someone else? And the answer is no. Uh, you're just trying to protect yourself, the person that would be liable is the one tossing the grenade in the first place. Um, so le legally, it's really easy, but morally, not as easy. Yeah, that, oh, I've heard a lot of thought experiments. I have not heard that grenade one, and I like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. And uh, that gives me a lot to a lot to ponder for sure. Um, okay, so let's move on um, to the reason for basically what we need if we're going to have laws. So I just wrote down law enforcement and prisons. Um, there are some people that think that uh, law enforcement is 
um, basically just created to um, return slaves back to their slave owners. And then uh, there's some people that think the only elements of law enforcement should be like community to community. So like even in a group of like 10,000, you'd have like every section of like 500 would like police their own area. And then some people think that prisons basically should not exist. Um, and so I guess I, I'm curious. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily many. You see wild stuff on the internet. That doesn't mean that um, a mm -hmm. lot of people feel this way, but uh, do you think we have to have some basic uh, federal, federal law enforcement and uh, prison, um, at least a oh, prison or prisons? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Uh, the people that, that don't are they're exa they're I, I think they're exaggerating but um mm -hmm. uh, so the police force uh, in the united states at least it did start as kind of a slave patrol they would capture escaped slaves from the south and that that, that escaped to the north from the south and bring them back to the south um but that was also when society was pretty regressive. We literally had slaves back then. Um, I would yeah. say that's pretty regressive. So we evolved past that. Um, well, let me comment on that real quick. Um, okay. I, I've heard that I've heard that idea of the and and I don't think it's necessarily wrong, but uh, I've never had a chance to really talk with somebody about that topic. And I wonder when people use the word police or at least like whatever whatever the term is for at that time that's referring to returning slaves when um when i when i look into history and i i see like around the time of john adams and let's what was it the boston massacre um mm -hmm. the, i don't know if they had any form of police but i know that they had it like the military was essentially the police and so you have you have people that are work for the government and if somebody does something illegal those people take them to the prisons and then they wait on trial and so trials existed. Um, the uh, so so bef essentially, I don't know when the idea of police or patrol people that specifically were for um, for slaves. I don't know if that started in the late 1700s. I don't know if that was as far back as the start of slavery. But there's arguments, but 1619, but also 1643, depending on how you look at it. Um, yeah, but there so. Do you know if uh, essentially before police had their own job that the military was just bigger and so some military was designed for stopping outsiders, but the other military was designed to, if they heard somebody murdered somebody, they're sent to somebody's house to go find the person that was the murderer and take them to jail? There had to be some kind uh, of law enforcement, I guess. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. Um, so after the Revolutionary War, um, just a couple years after, because we weren't with the Constitution at that point, we were with the Articles of Confederation, I think. So that one emphasized a uh, very small military. So it doesn't doesn't appear to me that they would be able to support it. And then what ended up happening was Shays' Rebellion, where a dude raised his own army to uh, fight the army. Um, so I wouldn't think... I'd. I think when people say that police were established as slave uh, patrols, mm -hmm. that's when they became institutionally recognized as um, people that do this job and the job happened to be catching slaves. Before that, it was probably something like local, locally appointed sheriffs, um, stuff like stuff like that, where it was more, it was more self-regulated. Um, they didn't, they, they had some institutional power, but it's not like what you see nowadays where, <laughs> Each cop is kitted out with like a SWAT team. Um, gotcha. Yeah it, yeah, it almost sounds like the uh, slave patrol was like bounty hunters, like where somebody would have a an image of what a slave looked like, like like they would right. draw yeah. it as best possible. Um, I don't know if you've seen Underground Railroad, the uh, Barry Jenkins uh, series. I haven't. No. Oh, okay. Then I can't go off of that. But um, anyways, uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I'd. Yeah. It, so it, yeah. What what I wanted to mention was that so uh, I guess if we if we accept the if we accept the notion that police was originally instituted as a slave patrol, um, let's just start there. Uh, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but that was a pretty significant part. Um, 
Oh, so I, I guess I, I sh so along the lines of institutional power. So bounty hunters are just private people that you that Southern slave owners would hire to go to the North, find them. But there is there is no uh, legal reason to like. So if a if a bounty hunter says, I think you're harboring a slave, open up. There's no legal reason to listen to them. But the police force, if they say that. So that's what I mean by uh, maybe there was. There, OK, so there was definitely policing, but. As an institution, a legal institution, police didn't exist until that purpose. Uh, maybe that's what is meant. I don't, I'm not really, I'm not very clear on the history. Mm -hmm. um, but going off the assumption that police were meant as a slave patrol, so they they brought slaves back to their owners where they, uh, where the subjugation was continued. So our society evolved from that past that point where we don't have slaves anymore. But what the police do has also evolved. So. A lot of people, or and not a lot of people, but people say that slavery actually never ended. It just, the parameters shifted. So the 13th Amendment said that no one shall be enslaved except in the case of incarceration. Mm. So if we if we look at these, if we look at, uh, what's it called? If we look at African-Americans right after slavery was abolished, so they're, they're going to be living in poverty. Uh, there, there was restitutions. I don't think they ever they don't I don't think they ever actually happened. What was interesting is that the slave owners got restitutions because they lost their slaves. So anyway, these it's like societies, a, a buyback. Yeah, yeah. Something messed up like that. So um these former slaves, these now freed slaves, they're now living in relative poverty because uh they never work, they never work for savings. They have some manual skills, but those aren't going to be paid highly um uh, because Obviously, people are used, or not people, but slave owners were used to getting that stuff for just, just for free, so they're not going to part with much money for it. So in order to get by, um, they would need to do crime, uh, because that's just how the resources were distributed. There wasn't enough for them, and there was probably too much for the slave owners. So the police, in that case, would then, uh, there would be a disproportionate rate of crime because of those material circumstances so the police would arrest uh arrest those slaves and then take them to prison they're incarcerated so back to slavery so mm -hmm. as as the society evolved so too did the forms of violence and the forms of racism and i saw a video uh, or i saw on that jordan peterson video where you mentioned that um Jordan Peterson is or so Hassan said Jordan Peterson's transphobic and he said that's not true because or like show show an example where show an example where Jordan uh, advocated for violence against uh, trans people. Um, does that sound right? Um, I don't know about violence, but just anywhere where he even stated anything um, other than not wanting his speech controlled. Okay, maybe I'm remembering that wrong, but that's a that's a pretty popular thing. Um, so you know you. That's like kind of the whole concept behind dog whistles, uh, where you know people will bring up the thirteen fifty. It's it's been overdone to uh, like the thirteen fifty statistic. It's been overdone yeah. to a meme. Um, pretty much, you know, if someone's spouting the thirteen fifty statistic as kind of like this gospel, you know that they've got some racism somewhere in there. Yeah. So, so I, well, I just want to comment on that real quick because okay. I, I agree with you that it might be likely in the same sense that if somebody says I have a black friend, I'm not racist or I'm colorblind or whatever. There's a there's a, 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 a I don't know if I'd say even likely, but there's a possibility that um, it would fit into the same category of what you're talking about. But I do. I'm a I'm a type of person that doesn't judge people outside of what they're actually saying. So if somebody says the 1350. um there's a chance that they're racist and they just know that. And so they're just saying the same shit they've heard everywhere, but there's a chance that um, they're just looking at the statistics and they're talking about um, how important it is. Now they could be wrong. They could be of the, uh, of a false understanding. Um, I just, I just don't think it's fair to say because somebody says like the idea of saying, I have a black friend, I'm not racist. I I actually am a uh, the for the only person I've ever heard defend that uh, which is a person I enjoy thoroughly is Sam Harris, and um, it really comes down to definitions. But yeah, it, uh, it's different now than say in the the late eighteen hundreds, where if somebody were to say I have a black friend, I'm not racist. That actually 
that actually fits <laughs> like if you truly right. have a black friend then you for, in some way or another do not think that white people are superior to black people and so it it you know it becomes this meme and it's this thing where people think it's silly to say um and so i i don't have too much to say on that but the the fact that 30 percent right. of um of the population is black and 50 percent are um of the prisoners are black that does not mean that they commit more crime but it also does not mean that they do not um it's just an interesting thing to look at i think right so the, basically the point i'm trying to make there is uh circling back to what we were originally talking about is that as as this society this fledgling society develops so too will the forms of oppression so too will the, will the forms of violence um Mm-hmm. So when we when I say violence, you probably think me punching someone, right? And um, that's a I imagined you meant physical, yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. So that that's a pretty. So everyone would agree that's violence. Me punching someone. Mm-hmm. Where it gets murkier is, uh, do you think handcuffing is violence? Um, do I think handcuffing is violence? Um, I I'll I'll uh paraphrase from what I wrote in the book. Um I I essentially put that uh law enforcement is needed to stop uh criminals from anything that we outlaw and that they should only ever use violence against the um the criminal if the the criminal is resisting arrest. So depending on if you think handcuffs are necessary the fir- let's say in a society the first person you ever arrest you just say um hey you did this thing and because you broke this law we're taking you in come on if they start running or if in the middle of taking them in they try to knock out the police officers and then run then when the group of officers get together later to go hey how do we prevent this in the future if eventually what's known is the best thing to do is certain kind of criminals to handcuff them then put them in the car yada 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 or in the wagon if we're if we don't have cars yet uh i mean so so yes anyways if i go put handcuffs on somebody the fact that i'm even getting physical with them at all i would consider that um violence of some kind um, if the police officer needs to do it or not, um, I believe at least the ability to, I would view as reasonable, but somebody might abuse that power. Yeah. So essentially where you have to start is whether, whether it's violence or not. And, um, so if it's not violent, if you don't think handcuffing is not, is, is, uh, if you don't think it's violent, then no problem, just go ahead and do it. It's not violent. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that. So the definition is always murky. Like, Let's say uh, I see a criminal trying to walk off and I just grab him by the arm. Would you consider that violence? Because I wouldn't uh, personally. But um, handcuffing. So that's pretty. It's the textbook of uh, handcuffing in in current society. Handcuffing is the standard. If you're taking someone in, you handcuff them, whether they're Mm -hmm. resisting arrest or not. Are you familiar with I Show Speed? With what? Are you uh, the streamer I Show Speed? Uh, No. So he's a he's a very he's like 18, 17, 16, very young, uh definitely under 18. Um he's uh he's black, which will become relevant soon. He was uh swatted um I think a week back, uh, and the police arrived and the immediate he was not violent at all. He was trying to explain to the officers, I'm a popular streamer, this happens to me. He was trying to explain, and the officer put him in handcuffs. Um and so in that case he wasn't re- he wasn't resisting arrest because no arrest was happening but the handcuffs were placed anyway so mm-hmm. that's that's why i asked the question um is handcuffing violence or not and the reason is because people see it as nonviolent; otherwise they would object to it being used so liberally with police mm-hmm. um and not to get too focused in on this i guess to i guess no. to brought him back out to where we started well, hold on. Let me comment on that because I, I, yeah. I do, I do think it's the, the the main reason I do these talks is I do like um, breaking down little elements. So, uh, no, I, you make a great point. Um, so, I do think handcuffing is violence, and I okay. do think that um, there there needs to be a reason 
for anything that brings any kind of harm. So the the law the the three combined laws we're about to get to, which is kind of the start of the book, but um, yeah. I was saving them for last, is a um, essentially um, <laughs> essentially a, a, a big spread of no physical, no unwanted physical contact. But uh, that would include enslavement, killing, and any kind of physical harm. And so, so um, I think all of those things should also include police officers to criminals. But where it becomes different is whatever the society has to figure, or at least the government has to figure out on what's the best approach to um, getting those criminals and protecting themselves. So I don't want to get too far into it, but I think that it's not as straightforward as a lot of people will watch Derek Chauvin with the knee on the neck of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get too far into that situation because that's a wild one. But a lot of people think the idea of the knee on the neck or the knee on the back is just the most absurd thing in the world. Nobody should ever do it to anyone. Um, now, George Floyd is a unique case, but there are thousands upon thousands of actual violent criminals that um, well, I, I can't remember the statistics, but there's a there's a crazy amount of police officers that die every year from criminals killing them when the police officers are trying to stop them. And so the amount, the thousands of criminals that um, are trying to resist and uh, not letting themselves be arrested there is a reason for the knee on the neck, knee on the back. I think it's usually um, the idea is like on the back or the shoulder right, until you right. can get enough backup. So so something might seem horrible, but there might be a reason for it. So I will right, say yeah. that if somebody just goes up to an 18-year-old that's a streamer, I, I, have, I don't have the backstory on why they walked in there. But if a police Swatted. officer... Okay, I, I'm not too familiar with that, but if a if a police officer at all just abuses their power, goes up to a random person, no matter what the age, and puts handcuffs on them and claims they did it for a good reason, that's not good. And anything like that, I think the I think the top people that need to be cracked down on are police officers. There's nothing right. more important than body cams and making sure that people are being held accountable. But if if it is known that whenever you feel that somebody is a criminal of a certain variety, that if it's necessary to put handcuffs on and then later you can take them off and apologize, um, there, there, there should be a reason. There should be it should be in the textbook of <laughs> of police officerdom <laughs> where it's if you believe that you need to arrest them because of this, that or the other that you put handcuffs on that I mean, I just feel that that is what it is. And if, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So I, so just a quick explanation on swatting swatting is, uh, so all these popular live streamers, as soon as they buy a house that those details are all over the internet. Um, so what trolls will do is they'll call the, call the, like the local law enforcement of where cause they know the address saying I'm at this address. I'm going to kill myself, my family, that sort of thing. And when and I'm taking and, and probably I'm taking a hostage. And what happens because there's a hostage involved, they need to get a SWAT team involved. So yeah. um, the idea is to get like so if they're live streaming, the idea is to get them to stop live streaming by literal use of police. Um, so this is what happened. But to I show speed, um, as soon as they arrived, obviously he's not violent. His mom is in good health, that sort of thing. Uh, but they handcuffed him until they were sure. Um, well, no, past when they were sure, uh, past when they deduced that there was no violence happening. Um, so to, to generalize what my point is, violence, as society develops, so does violence. Um, back in the olden days, you steal some bread, they kill you. Um, so that was the violence. So in comparison, getting handcuffed, not violence. But nowadays, when we have a more, well, we don't really have an empathetic view of criminals, but we have a more empathetic view of criminals, instead of Instead of killing them, we try to rehabilitate them. And obviously the, the U.S. prison system is not good at that, but we at least try. Not very well, um, but we try to. So in that case, killing would be uh, unjustified violence mm -hmm. and um, violent or handcuffing is the justified violence that the police has been imbued with the power to use because, um, you know, you don't prosecute the police for handcuffing someone they have. So if I handcuff someone, I would get prosecuted. If the police handcuff someone in the middle of arrest, they don't. Mm -hmm. So um, 
as society develops, so too does violence. Um, that's the main point I want to make with that. Okay. No, that, that, that is a good point. Um, uh, I, I do want to, uh, backtrack to a point you made about, um, slavery continuing in a very different way. Cause, uh, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the history on it. So I don't know if I exactly agree that it happened, but I don't disagree that it happened. Um, from what I picture that is being said, let's, let's imagine there were 5 million slaves in, uh, uh, in the South. And then when slavery ended and they were forced to not have slaves the way they did owned by individuals, um, the police figured out a way to let, let, let's have a hypothetical where let's say the police figured out a way to arrest all of them. And then they were slaves of the government. So essentially they were like state workers that didn't get paid. Uh, they, you know, you'd come up with a fake reason to arrest them, you arrest them. And then they have to work these fields. They kind of like today when we see like uh, prisoners landscaping some highway area or something, um, you you essentially just have all these slaves to do that. So nobody's allowed to make them pick cotton and do all this various stuff where the slave owners can rape them and all this stuff. But uh, but now the states, this the southern states, could uh, make them work for them. Okay. So uh, obviously this is a horrible thing to, uh, to do. And so I guess um, what that comes down to is when I'm trying to design this desirable society, I actually have this uh, section that I'm writing and I haven't fully challenged myself on it. So maybe uh, you can help me with that. It's the idea mm -hmm. of if, if somebody in prison should be f ever forced to, um, to do an action other than being locked up. Now you you we could uh, make sure that they're able to get the, a certain amount of sunshine. They're able to exercise and definitely able to socialize because humans are social creatures. So um, right. we, let, we let them socialize. But should they ever be forced to do any labor? And I guess right. I'm so to hear your thoughts on that. So I probably I think uh, when Lincoln and his uh, Congress drafted that Thirteenth Amendment. They probably didn't realize that this would happen because they were the ones trying to free, trying to free the slaves in the first place. And there's some complexity there. Um, I've I've read some stuff about how Lincoln was actually a raging racist himself, but he just didn't want the South to break away. And that and but but hypothetically, they didn't actually intend for that to happen. Um, what they probably thought was. Uh, because education was so scarce um, and that's the main way to escape that cycle of recidivism is to educate yourself to get your in, in modern in modern terms educate yourself to get yourself into a position where you can have a more qualified job one with more stability hopefully one with more pay um, so that you don't have to resort to crime so they but that wasn't really a thing back in the 1800s so they probably thought well they're just sitting there anyway might as well put them to work and then after afterwards uh the plantation owners who had a huge amount of capital and by extension, a huge amount of influence in Southern politics. Um, they influenced the shaping of the police uh, from a slave patrol into uh, I guess a, a different kind of slave patrol. So um, should you have, uh, should you have something in, in the uh, what's it called? Should you in your ideals or in your hypothetical society, should you have, uh, should it be disallowed to, um, have prisoners work for or just have prisoners work and um it's a complicated answer but i think a better way to answer that is that your prisons should be designed around rehabilitation as opposed to uh retribution so you should be looking at more of a restorative justice model of uh and a rehabilitative model of prison so um what what that would mean is uh Probably you could you could have them work, but it would have to be voluntary and you would have to pay them a decent wage for it. And you should also offer options like uh, education programs or maybe trade schools uh, if if you don't really like the idea of prisoners going to prison to get a psychology degree or something. So trade school is something that's directly applicable um, mm. so that afterwards they actually have a chance at existing in society lawfully. For sure. So um, when I look at our society, I mean, there's so many things that we should fix about the, the U.S. prisons. But uh, whenever I, I don't know how much to uh, believe from what's off on TV versus not, I, I don't do, I haven't done any research about knowing what exactly happens in prisons. But the idea that 
people form form gangs in prisons and there's hierarchies based on basically everything going on in the prisons are are bad um i i think it would probably be best to figure out a way to crack down on that to um to make it so people inmates don't rape other inmates to remove all that stuff and yeah to rehabilitate to to get them education anybody that's in there because they stole something because they were poor um figure out how to get them in the best situation where they get a punishment because you have to um you have to try to convince other people to not <laughs> do the crime so you they have to know that there is a punishment that exists but then also to make it to where where when they go back out on the streets they're fine um but as far as um this goes this society where everything's um broken down to uh simple things um the the detail i'm going for is like what's acceptable of the government not necessarily what's the best thing the government can do so that comes down to is it acceptable to physically harm and i don't think so unless they are preventing the criminal from doing something themselves um but this the slavery element of it um of because uh, I because I view it as enslavement if uh if you make a prisoner uh work or do anything physical um and so what I what I one thing I view it as is the prisoner did the crime which put them in this area mm -hmm. you and and people need to eat people need um I I don't know if prisoners need much else if they I'm guessing their uh their clothes they wear it's like two outfits that will uh, last them for years um and the blankets you probably have one blanket anyway so so food is kind of the main thing you need so I imagine there being a reasonable amount of uh you fold the the laundry at the prison or you work in the cafeteria area or so, something to where you the government, I don't think, should legally be able to force you to do anything. But if you refuse to do offered work, then you you don't get fed, um, or or something like that. Because the alternative I could imagine would be in a society like the one we're talking about would be sending a prisoner to live somewhere else, kind of like uh, back in the day when Australia got <laughs> became what it became by prisoners from the UK getting sent to Australia. And I don't think that people that do these acts that we deem um, unworthy to put on other humans, that they should be sent somewhere else. So um, would you say it's, it's fair that somebody should have to do some kind of labor in prison to be fed in prison? No, uh, I wouldn't say so. And I know, I know that like, I know that's going to tickle like the, the common sense gauge on some people, but uh, I want to offer a different pers perspective. So in okay. Germany, um, if you try to escape from prison, um, and obviously you get caught because uh, you tried and you didn't succeed. But if you once you do get caught, you don't get charged for trying to escape prison. So they won't tack on whatever number of years it is to your sentence because you try to escape. What they will tack on is the fact that you're wearing the clothes provided by the prison so that's theft from the prison so they'll add mm, kind of a minor sentence to that yeah so the re the rationale behind that and germany uh these nordic countries european countries they are more uh geared towards rehabilitation um what can we do to stop these people from uh what's the word, relapsing into crime again mm. um and Prison is, a especially for violent criminals, prison isn't necessary just for the safety of the rest of the population. But prison itself is a traumatic experience, um, even if you have one of the better experiences. Mm -hmm. You are quite literally having your liberties taken away. So yeah. they recognize that it's a traumatic experience, um, and that's why you're not charged for trying to escape. So instead, the focus should be, instead of, uh, instead of the prisoner having to work, um, to essentially help cover costs of them being in there, which, to be honest with you, it, it costs, uh, I think the last number, it costs like $40,000 a year to house a single prison inmate in the United States. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so I don't really think there's any amount of work a prisoner can do that would value, um, especially if it's like, you know, folding laundry. I don't like whether you do that or you don't, it's not going to help cover costs. So in that in that sense, I don't think it's effective. Um, instead, it should be viewed as what is is this going to help the prisoner once they're freed 
stay uh live illegal live legally live a lawful life and stay out of prison um so you could take that into account when it comes to like parole um you know letting prisoners out early for good behavior um mm -hmm. they refuse to help out in the kitchen or whatever so probably they're not going to be the best once they get out but in terms of forcing definitely not no gotcha gotcha yeah no that's interesting i don't know I don't know exactly where I stand on it, um, but it is interesting. I mean, I, I do know where I stand on like prison in general and the route I would take. Um, I believe it was a uh, right. McC McCain in Arizona set up something pretty awesome where I don't know if it was one prison or multiple prisons, but where he made it where the prisoners could garden. So they had areas where they would go and they'd grow their own food. And that food was actually used in the prison stuff like that. I think there's a lot of amazing ideas for rehabilitating uh, me personally, just so you can know, I'm very anti the idea of punishment. I don't think anybody should be um, made to suffer, even if they're a horrible person. If somebody has some mental illness like um, Jeffrey Dahmer or something that goes out and kills, what did he kill, 13 people? And uh, obviously he needs to be removed from society. But a lot of people, especially maybe the family of pe of his victims, would want him to suffer. They would they wish that they could make him suffer. And I can see this horrible thing that happened. And I have no interest in him suffering or anybody suffering. Um, I view prisons as a as a way to uh, deter people from committing certain acts and then once somebody has committed an act i view prisons as a way to remove them from being able to commit those acts again um and uh so yeah so so it's complicated i just uh right so, yeah so, and for yeah. for there there are people that aren't rehabilitatable and, and that's why we have life sentences uh death penalty you can have your stance on it i guess um, i don't really i don't really well, you probably so one, you probably shouldn't have a death penalty, but um yeah. like people would argue life in prison is worse anyway. So there are people that are beyond re rehabilitation. Um and that's another purpose that prisons serve, but that's a very low percentage of people, um, I would think, because crime is so intricately linked, or not intricate, so closely linked with socioeconomic conditions. So there's there's the idea that if, if you fix those socioeconomic conditions they wouldn't have done the crime in the first place so mm -hmm. um i, I think yeah. that's probably true about a lot of people not necessarily yeah. all they're it, it kind of no, like you have yeah. like celebrities that like to uh shoplift <laughs> they don't need to but they just do it um yeah now no, that's not the hugest crime in the world obviously it'd be great if most of the people in jails were there because they were just dorks wanting to shoplift for fun um, that would be but, nice. yeah. <laughs> but there will always be people that no matter, no matter how much money they have, no matter how much, uh, you know, they have shelter, clothing, everything, yeah. they, they might be a violent person that still wants to go out and, uh, pick fights, uh, be part of gangs, stuff like that. Um, but I think you're right. I think it would, uh, if we removed all the, uh, nonviolent, uh, crimes, like, anything involving drugs, take all those people out of jail, anything involving um, something where somebody did it just to feed their family. It'd be interesting to see how many people are in jail for ridiculous reasons like that. Um, right. And yeah. So for more of a practical look on how it is in practice, there was actually in like 2018, the, uh, I think the head warden of one of the prisons uh, in like Louisiana or something, one of the South, so one of the South Southern States, Mm -hmm. uh, he was asked about what he would think about uh, release, so like being more generous with parole because his prison was getting overcrowded. And his answer is that if we do that, we lose some of the best workers. Oof. Yeah. yeah. He said that so, out loud? This was recent? Said, this is like 2018. Yeah. Um, I can try to find a video. If wow. You want. Yeah. Wow. That's that. wild. What? Oh, even if he was trying to make a joke, that's wild uh wow yeah yeah God. so that's just yeah how much yeah how much uh um looks like i found it yeah there we go uh i'll just post it in the chat it's uh not not a very long article but just to get an idea of kind of where things are at <laughs> at prisons here um so it really is a big problem um so that's not what sh that's not what prison should be about it's not cheap labor that you can get yeah definitely 
Um, yeah. Wow. That's wild. Um, I will, uh, I'll read that after, uh, we're done here, Yeah. but, uh, yeah. I, I, I am, I, I guess I'll throw out my thoughts on death penalty and I'm curious if you have different reasonings or where exactly you stand on it. Um, I guess I, I have moral and uh, non-moral reasons for this, but I'll, I'll go off of what I'm doing with the book. So everything with the book is based off a mutual benefit for everybody involved. And so, uh, but I leave morals out, even though I think some laws should be based on morals. Um, but for the death penalty, the reason I think the mutual benefit uh, reason um, it sh there should be no death penalty is... I looked it up, and uh, between 1974 and now in the U.S., there's uh, 194 um, people were um, convicted. Let's see, they were they were sentenced to death, and uh, 194 that uh, ended up being exonerated. So I don't know if like some of them were executed and some weren't. But either way, the 194 were found by DNA testing or various different things to have been falsely convicted. And so what I would say in a society where um, everybody is basically agreeing, I don't kill you, you don't kill me, I'm part of the society. If there's a possibility that somebody that did not break this law is going to be executed by the government that's supposed that the only reason for that government and society is to protect you. Um, I, I guess it just, uh, ero it erodes the trust in the government. So I don't think, I, I think that's one of the main reasons if there was some way to magically know these people actually did these murders, maybe, maybe it's all right. But anyways, uh, what's, what's your reasoning if you're against the death penalty? The death penalty is a relic of um, when it actually was cheaper to just kill someone instead of locking them up, feeding them, giving a place, shelter, all of that for, uh, let's say, a life sentence of uh, 50, 60 years. So that was actually so in the old times, that was actually pretty expensive. And when your other option is just slice off their heads, um, just uh, logistically speaking, it's not hard to see why that would that would have been a popular thing. Nowadays, um, nowadays, death penalties end up costing more than uh, an actual life sentence. Most of it comes down to legal fees, um, so perhaps that could that could be a way to address it. So on the practical side, it doesn't work anymore because we're a little more humane than chopping off heads. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the on the on the, like the moral or the ethical or maybe even the legal stance. Uh, or the, or the political stance is that uh, you shouldn't be giving the government power to execute people. Um, that's kind of the, that's the most popular line of reasoning that I've seen. Um, mm -hmm. It just sets a bad precedent. Combine that with uh, the practical aspect of cops being pretty bad at their jobs in general. Like you mentioned, uh, a lot of those um, convictions were false. Uh, we have better technology proving that. And uh, there's no way of knowing um, in a lot of cases, there's no way of knowing how uh, how many of those are actually false. So, yeah, um, given both the like the moral concerns and then also the practical, just it's cheaper to just keep them in prison. Um, yeah, that's a it's a hard no. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's best when figuring out not not that you said anything wrong, but uh, the the finance aspect of it, like a, a lot of people, when they talk about abortion, they'll talk about overflowing um orphanages and then when they talk about um things like this it'll be about the money involved and i think a good way to break down if it's right or wrong it uh, would be to to take away that that money aspect because a society could figure out a way to execute without it costing that much money but anyways i i think we both have plenty of good reasons and, for um, yeah not executing anyways yeah yeah it's just like so like if it was a maybe back then because it was just cheaper, it's a hard no now because it's both it's not cheap. It's both it's more expensive and also it's kind of a sucky thing to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, all right. Um, I, I got a couple more here, um, but how are we doing on time as far as uh, your availability? Oh, I'm good for <laughs> I'm good for okay. hours. I don't think it'll last that long, but I'm good. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, no, I don't I don't think so either. Um, but yeah, um, OK. So, okay, so we covered military, borders, immigration, law enforcement, and prisons. So what I have left on here is um, 
the details. Okay, so starting with no killing, I think the the number one reason to start a society, um, at least for everybody involved, like on average. So some people would want a society because they don't have food. So if they were part of a society, that society would help them. But uh, the people that do have food, that's not a good reason for them. But uh, I would guess any human living in nature where they're constantly in fear of being killed by other humans or being killed by wild animals, uh, they would want to group together to have protection from being killed. Um, do do you think that's a that's a reasonable guess that like the the main reason to start a society would be protection from being killed? Not necessarily, because if things go sideways in the society, um, all right, so with society, actually, you uh, you dramatically, exponentially, or I don't, I don't even know, what the, I don't even know what the right term is, but so much more chances of catching infectious diseases, which uh, I think, I think infectious diseases have killed more people than the totality of uh, warfare. Um, obviously, we don't have an accurate number, but just looking at so like you know people say that a lot of people died died in the civil war that was like two hundred fifty thousand I think um, counting both sides uh -huh. that's like that's like three seconds of smallpox so um, it doesn't necessarily make you more safe more safe it makes you more safe from uh, the violence of me punching you in that in that sense yeah it makes you more safe from that mm -hmm. um, what I think people form societies for is for more freedom. And I don't mean that in like in the sense that freedom to do whatever, uh, but I mean that in the in the sense of freedom of being able to do more with your time, with with your efforts. So, for an example, um, you've got your standard two way street. So one one lane is one lane is uh, I guess north, and the other lane is south, right? Mm -hmm. um, who decides? Uh, so freedom in like the naive sense of the word would be. You choose whichever lane you want to drive on, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you're you're able to drive. You have more choices. That's that's like the naive conception of freedom. Um, but actually, that just sucks because uh, nobody knows which side to drive on. And those those farmers with F one fifties who definitely don't have uh, small genitalia and their wives definitely aren't cheating on them. They'll just drive in the middle of the road um, mm -hmm. anyway because they don't they don't care. So. In that case, um, what society does to make you more free is they'll regulate which side of the which side of the road is north, which side of the, of the road is south. Um, and while you're technically not able to do more in the sense of you can't like you're limited, your space is limited to drive. But because of that regulation, you can drive to places you can drive to other places faster because, you know, there's not a traffic jam. As well as the fact that you'll probably avoid more accidents that way, uh, less people dying. So in that sense, more free. So mm -hmm. when people get into societies, um, advanced societies especially, they're giving up their ability to you know go and find find food for themselves. They're not hunting anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Instead, they're I mean like there will be some farmers, but instead they're I don't know they're writing plays or they're writing books or they're working as an accountant somewhere. Um, but instead of having to worry about constantly, how do I find food? Where am I going to, where am I going to find it? Um, instead, you can devote your time and your energy to other things. And as society gets more advanced, so too does uh, the ability to free your populace into doing whatever they want. So um, food was probably the first, food and water was probably the first thing that they figured out. Um, mm -hmm. And then afterwards, farming, uh, after that, probably or I actually don't know. But afterwards, we, we got we've moved up into like AC, so we can live in relative comfort. And uh, now we have uh, heating, so that we can live in cold places without having to start fires, which are pretty dangerous, um, relatively speaking. So um, that is my conception of society, uh, so that you can do more with your life than what you were able to do before. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that take. And I think um I think how I describe freedom in the book is probably more of how you describe the the naive version of freedom. But uh cuz I cuz when you live out in nature like in say groups like maybe chimps do, um 
you have all the freedom you could possibly want. If you, you, you are free to say whatever you want, do whatever you want. You can kill people. You can rape people. You can steal from them. You can say anything. There's no such thing as not having free speech out in nature. And so I don't think of uh, starting a society uh, uh, basically, you have to sacrifice freedoms to start a society. But but I but right. I think you're I think you're right. I mean, because and that's why I view it as um, protections, even as simple as the, like the road you were describing. You could have this road created, but without a society telling you which side to drive on, it could be dangerous. You can get in wrecks because there's no that nobody has decided. So cars are just driving on it, and depending how fast one's going. They might hit you. And so the, the society creating the law would give you this freedom to drive as far as you want without getting harmed. And I guess that's why I call that protection is the society is um, figuring out how to protect you. So um, I, I guess we're just we're, we're probably just using different words to describe I the think, same thing. I think it goes beyond protection, actually, because consider uh, no regulation on which side you can drive on. So you're going to drive slow, right? Because if you're driving fast and it ends up that the person ahead of you disagrees and you're headed on a (laughs) head-on collision, you Mm -hmm. want to go slow so that you you, uh, preserve the maximal chance of surviving that because no freedoms if you're dead. Um, So I think it goes beyond just uh, protecting life um, because you're you're able to drive faster. So less time spent and you can get more done. Um, So that's what I mean by being able to do more um besides just not dying it's about being able to make more use of your time to uh depending on what your priorities are maybe you want to get home faster so you can get back to your family yeah maybe you want to get to work earlier so that you can put in more work towards curing cancer or something i don't know um Mm -hmm. but in that sense you're more free to do that stuff because you're spending less time on roads thanks to regulation yeah yeah, no, that's that's a great point. Like the idea of being in a society where everyone cooperates makes it to where you have this wild amount of freedom. I think it's to a level that's beyond this skeleton that I'm writing. But uh, mm-hmm. that the idea of creating, you know, AI self driving cars, uh, checkouts at the grocery store that you know, getting to the point where at some point maybe um more than half the population doesn't have to work, so they have to set up some kind of UBI or something. And then somebody can just spend their time doing something they care about. Somebody that's like a passionate musician uh, doesn't have to work because we've figured out how to have this freedom to just record music all day and to be out in nature and live a good life because we together, or at least the the geniuses of the society, uh, created ways to um, to get by. Um, so yeah, I, right. I, def- I definitely agree. Um, with that, let, well, let me bring up a, an interesting thing because, uh, because how I have this set up with the skeleton element and, uh, it's based on adding like one law at a time. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Most people kind of are unable to answer this question. Um, so okay. far out, out of the couple dozen people I've talked to, my wife is the only one that has answered this, <laughs> um, or at least, sorry, anybody listening to this that I've asked this question to, I don't think you haven't answered this. It's just, uh, uh, it, it's easy to want to dodge this. So yeah. when when I set up in uh, this society that um, nobody can kill and I'm leaving morals out of it, it's the mutual benefit. You don't kill me. I don't kill you. Mm-hmm. And so it when I break it down and try to figure out why we don't kill without using morals, it kind of comes down to that because we're not using morals, not using religion. The reason that it makes sense for people to agree to this is because if everybody agrees to it, there is the benefit. Now, where there, reco- where there becomes not a mutual benefit is when somebody agrees to not kill somebody that can't kill them back. So let's take like an infant. Uh, if If you, most people would not want to kill an infant. But there's no there's no uh, mutual benefit there where you're not going to die you're not going to be harmed from that infant anyways. So I in the book I break down this idea of um, how detailed we look at like who deserves the protection if you leave the morals out of it. Now morally, because an infant can uh, suffer and feel pain, you might have a moral reason. But uh, just taking people fresh out of nature and figuring out a mutual beneficial reason. Um, I've, I've gotten down to, um, not knowing exactly how to view infants, which, uh, gets me to this category of 
if a mother feels that she can't feed her infant. And in this society, let's say the first and only law is no killing. Um, you can't kill, but they haven't figured out exactly if they want to have wiggle room for uh, a parent killing their infant. If a mother feels like she cannot feed her infant and she kills that infant, um, but there are no laws about like adoption. There's no foster care. There's none of this stuff. There might be a couple people in the society that would be willing to uh, take somebody's kid. But let's let's say that um, maybe there's not enough people that be willing to do that. Um, do you think with this bare bones one single law that it would be better to have it be where it's illegal for a parent to um, quickly take out their kid? Um, or should that person, um, or should that be illegal? Yeah. So this situation you're talking about, there's failure at multiple points. The society is not able to support the mother. The mother is not, the society is not able to support the infant through, like you mentioned, foster care adoption. The mother's not able to support the infant for whatever reason. Um, so multiple points of failure. So, um, but so like I, I would go for a more prevention angle, but since we're already in this situation where the mother wants to kill the infant, or I guess maybe wants is too harsh, but feels she has no choice but to kill the infant. Um, yeah, I would say that's illegal, but it's just like, it's like, you know, uh, you know how like if you're a parent um, and you leave, you're not supposed to leave your kid in like a hot car or mm -hmm. in a car in like hot because they're gonna die um yeah well after after that happens they they're you it's obviously you killed your kid by doing that um but they don't usually charge you for anything very hard for that because yeah you broke the law you're already getting punished like what is this exactly what what is slapping prison on you exactly gonna do so yeah. usually when that happens um uh, they're not charged very hard at the, at the at the maximum it's involuntary manslaughter um mm -hmm. and usually with the lighter sentence uh be because well like, they're not like it's obviously obviously something you didn't want to happen at all um so yeah it should be illegal um it really like it really depends on what kind of adjudication you want to give it um okay. if you want to be really punitive i guess you can i guess you can do that if you don't want to be really punitive that's probably a better idea Okay. Well, let me throw, let's set that aside for one sec. Let me throw something at you and then we'll bring that right back. Um, okay. So, so let's say we're not in my hypothetical anymore. You're just in nature. You're part of a group of like 20 people and, uh, and everybody else is parts of groups of 20 people. Um, this is all in nature, no laws, none of that stuff. Let's say you're wandering around. You're, you're just, you wandered for a while and you got somewhere and you witness two adult males uh, coming across each other and you hear enough conversation to know they've never met. One guy says, uh, why are you looking at me weird? The other guy says, Hey, I don't know you. I'm not looking at you weird. No, no harm here. And then the guy that thought the other guy was looking at him weird, just kills him, just straight up kills him. Uh, you know, there's no laws, so there's no, you, you can have your own personal morals and thoughts on this. Um, but there's no laws and this guy just decided to kill this guy. And let's say, you know, that you can press a button or not really a button, but you, let's just say, you know, you can kill the guy that did the killing and you'd be fine. You don't have to worry about his tribe or his family or anybody um, coming after you. You can just press this button and he's dead. Uh, would you kill the guy that killed the other guy in this natural setting? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely would. Okay. Um, same here. Um, okay. So now let's imagine the same thing happens, but you are wandering around and you see, let's make it a man instead of a woman, uh, instead of a mother, you see a father. And so, you know, you see this like 30 year old guy and he has, um, let's say he has a two year old and a four year old and also a two month old and you witness him kill the two month old. So you're witnessing this killing and, and, and let's say that you hear him. Um, he's very open. He tells his, the, his other kids, um, we're all going to starve to death. If we try to feed another person, I'm going to kill, I'm going to kill this, uh, two month old of ours. Um, so I can be able to feed the rest of you. 
So uh, he kills the two month old and you witness it. Do you, what do you do? See, it's hard to divorce. It's hard to divorce myself from, um, as you say, like moralities or laws. Um, Cause my gut reaction is don't kill. Cause there's two kids and it's not like I want to take on two kids if I killed it. Um, but that would, that would indicate a moral obligation to take on those two kids if I killed the, the father um, but that's not present here. So it's hard to divorce myself from that. Um, no, I wouldn't kill. Okay. W- would you kill if there weren't the two kids? So he, he just killed a two-month-old because... Uh, he, he killed the two-month-old. And we can say, we can assume, I think it's it's important to assume that so, he didn't... So like, same reasoning... Just, um, yeah, he didn't kill a random two year two month old that he he kidnapped from somebody. It's his own two month old, and we can say that whether he's right or wrong, he could be incorrect in his estimation of food and survival. But he killed it to um, because he knew that if he didn't, maybe he couldn't uh, feed himself and the two month old. Maybe there's a yeah. wife somewhere else. But anyways, his his reasoning is his own reasoning is because he didn't think he could feed that two month old. Yeah, I'd probably kill him. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, like, so, okay, well, one, I think he's extremely dumb. Just eat a little less and feed it to the baby. But <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, going, yeah. going beyond that, probably to address what your actual question is there. Uh, it just comes down to, uh, in that situation, I'm entirely focused on my own survival because uh, I'm not with a you said I'm not with a tribe, right? Or oh, you're with the tribe around. of like of like twenty. Okay, well, even in that case, I'm my, I'm focused on uh, depending on how selfish I am. I'm either focused primarily on the survival of my tribe, or I'm focused on uh, my own survival with the tribe being secondary. In either case, this guy's not from the tribe, or even if he was from the tribe, that would be kind of messed up to do. Um, but since my focus is entirely on that. Um, if he's willing to kill a two-year-old, like what exactly is stopping him from killing me? That sort of thing. So in that sense, yeah, I'd probably kill him. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, and this is the complicated thing I I come up with for breaking down this initial law in, in the society. It, uh, you know, I like to put myself in a situation. I like to imagine it in nature and then in the society. But uh, so when you have the the two other kids there, I imagine this society that has not figured out um, a way to have adoption and and whatnot. So even though you can quickly just snap your fingers and say, OK, let's make this society have that, um, it, it would involve a handful of different things. You'd have to um, it involve a monetary system, taxation, uh, ways to pay people to um, do this extra job. So that's why I like to leave that out of it. So just having the simple thing of join our society, the only thing that changes from nature is there's no killing. And so you could either live out in nature where everything's just fair game, people still kill and rape and all that, or come to this society where there's no killing. And then I just imagine that until other laws are created, until the society is uh, flourishing and figuring different things out, that if... um if there was a parent that wanted to, um, well, let's just say if there's an adult, an adult trying to kill an adult, then you have you lock that person up because you want the society to feel safe from you being a person that can choose to live in the society. Um, you're protected. That's why you feel good being there. But um, as far as like an infant goes, if uh, if if somebody's going to take out their infant, even if they're dumb and they were wrong and they could feed it, but they thought they couldn't. If you lock up that person or execute that person and there's a couple kids there, there's a two-year-old and a four-year-old, then the question becomes like, it's not just that the society creates an adoption situation then, it's the society can either lock up that adult and then the the other kids just are where they are. They're they're in this society where they're protected from being killed, but they're not, they don't have anything else. They're not protected from neglect or anything. Um and you could say that maybe you can find people that would take them in, but what if this happens over and over and over again? Um, so I can't get myself to the level of at this bare bones one law, 
not feeling like the parent um, should be able to kill. It's it's kind of an extreme version of abortion, I guess. Like the, I, <laughs> I'm I'm pretty against abortion because I yeah. feel that in our society um, we can uh, do other options. But uh, it, in the case that the idea of abortion, where somebody says like this person can't take care of this, like a lot of people use the excuse of. Uh, not having uh, the finances set up or not it'll ruin their lives because they can't go to school or whatever so I guess I look at this as in this close to nature situation somebody might or or let's say the child is born with their very crippled and um, it would be almost impossible for them to take care of the kid and also like take care of their farm and whatnot Um, yeah it's complicated. Though. Yeah. So uh, what what I would say is if you have a society where there's a law of no killing. Um, so I guess if there's only one law, you haven't set up like a judicial system and all that. Right. Yeah. So basically there is the things we listed earlier. You have a military, you have borders, you have potential immigration laws, you have law enforcement and prisons. And then aside oh, you have prisons. From, you have prisons. But aside oh, from okay. that, the only thing is. Uh, no killing and then the question comes down to this one that we're we're analyzing yeah so i would say in like uh the the difference between in the wild you killing the parent that kills their kid for whatever reason um a society is built so that you don't have to do that you have the prison because obviously i'm not going to drag around a grown-ass man sorry sorry for if you don't like the swearing <laughs> oh, no, i'm not going to drag around a grown-ass man um and set up my own prison in the wild. So um, I would probably just kill him. Um, mm. But in society, you're kind of set up to be able to not do that and maybe even um, get, get some productivity out of that person. So I know we were just talking about how no no working in prison, but this is just developing society. Maybe you should probably take advantage of it. That's, that's what I mean about morality. It always changes. Uh, if things are really scarce, yeah, work those prisoners for sure. But if things aren't scarce, <laughs> but, probably so, don't do it. So it it doesn't fix the element of if they do have other kids um, other than maybe oh, what the happens kids. To the, yeah, what happens to those kids? The kids can live in a prison with them. Um, but even let, let's remove that element and try to make it uh, more simple. Let's say that they don't have kids and then you put them in prison. Then you you convince other people to not kill their own infants. But if the only law is no killing, then there's no law about neglect. Um, So if, uh, if somebody takes their two month old and sets it on a couch, well, they don't have couches. uh, They just set it on the ground and they just let it die. I'd, I'd feel like it's obviously more humane to um, execute that kid. I don't know if executes the word, but to kill the kid than to um, neglect it to death. Um, Right. So, so having this simple law of no killing, uh, it, it makes me, I mean, it's a silly idea because obviously you don't need to only have one law, but if you did, I just, if, for some reason, I just can't get over this hump of if you, if you, uh, if you imprison the person that did it, then you're going to convince people to neglect their kids instead of going the more humane route And then if you imprison them and they have kids, then where do those kids go? And yeah. 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 That's yeah. I guess with the constraints that you put in, but yeah, I just, uh, I just, it's like an unnatural constraint, I think. Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. So is that what you wanted to cover on society building? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that was the gist of it. I, I, there are a hand, I actually do got to hop off here. Um, so I think this is a good stopping point. There was a okay. handful of things I I did want to go over. And if we talk at a future time, um, we can talk about other harms, um, stuff like, um, circumcision and, oh, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, and various different things like if, uh, you know, using, um, medications that can, um, can, uh, affect somebody's mindset. Like if, uh, if uh, children should be on like medications for like stuff like ADHD, stuff like that. Um, uh-huh. uh, at what level does, should the government um, have an effect on parenting, like um, l- laws, like certain car seats to protect kids, um, various things like that. Um, but I, but we covered uh, the bulk of the, the bare bones of it. So.
Okay. Yeah. So I think something we could talk about next time and uh, we could try to find a time for that um, is uh, so we covered a lot of developing society things. And um, I guess the, the one thing we probably agree on is that it's hard to agree on a, a set, a set circumstance of rule or set uh, set number of rules because circumstances change. Uh, maybe you do need to work the prisoners. Maybe you don't. Um, I guess something we can talk about next week or not next week, but next time is uh, how how uh, how things should work in contemporary society. Um, I do want to get to abortion at some point. I'd be interested in hearing yeah. what you have to say about that. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah this is fun. Um, let's set up another one if we can. Awesome. Sounds good. Good talking. Uh, take care. Thanks. You too. Bye.